forward to the cloud. We're recording. Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin again, and welcome to version seven of the Digital Rebar Online Meetup. Today, we've got a fun series of things scheduled for uh, today's meetup. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the impending DRP 3.5 release and some of the uh, pieces and parts and changes and fixes that will be in that release. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the KubeCon and Cloud Native Con recap. Just talk about what are some of the things we saw there, uh, some of the interesting takeaways from the conference. Uh, we'll talk about our newly updated, revamped Terraform provider, which we're working towards uh, being accepted by the general HashiCore community and look forward to seeing that go into uh, HashiCore as soon as we get through that vetting process. And then we were going to talk about something else that I've forgotten about already. So hopefully we'll remember <laughs> that and pick that up. It's a new uh, I suspect. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, uh, last uh, time on the 5th of December, we had our sixth meetup. And as always, we have the video re replay that's in our agenda list. Uh, and we have all of the information there. Uh, for those of you uh, looking for more information, rebar.digital, as always, and rackend.com. Uh, we also love talking to people on our community Slack. So if you haven't already joined community Slack, join us there. In the meantime, let's move over to, did I, I didn't document it. I don't think so. Anyways, we'll talk about uh, today. Let's start with, what do you guys want us to start with? You want to start with uh, 3.5 or you want to start with KubeCon? Why don't we start with KubeCon? That was pretty exciting. Uh, KubeCon and Cloud Native Con was in Austin, Texas on the 7th, 8th, 9th of December. And uh, we had all of the rack end team there in force for the most part. And uh, Rob, why don't you kick off with just an overview of your experience with KubeCon? Oh, wow. Um... So my, I was mostly hallway track um, sessions and, and talking to people and, and seeing it. And uh, it's about 4,500 people. And it had a lot of the feel of like an OpenStack Portland or an OpenStack um, uh, uh, San Diego, that, that sort of size. Yeah, Actually, the people weren't San Diego. crawling over each other like Portland, uh, OpenStack Portland Summit. That was crazy. People were stacked literally like firewood in some of the rooms that's well the rooms the, uh, as far as i could tell the rooms were pretty crowded the the they used the uh the north the south half of the conference center but the venue i mean it, the energy was high people knew each other um it still has you know it has a bit of a vendor flavor to it meaning that a lot of the people who were that we were that i saw there were, were vendors um but i think that there's a significant number of customer users also within the infrastructure um a lot of, you know, and the, the keynotes are sort of, you know, rah, rah, let's change, you know, change the world type of things. Um, I, for all that, I, I wrote a post, I'm, I'm not going to rehash it here about why I don't think the Kube, the Kube community is going to, is, is like the OpenStack community, because I just don't think it's, it's not an infrastructure group. Um, they're much more worried about dev process and things like that. Um, and then my big takeaways are that there are still a lot of unsolved problems in the Kubernetes um, space. Uh, so service mesh is just emerging, but I think it adds a lot of complexity. Storage is still pretty much a uh, maybe. Um, and, <laughs> and some of the networking things are, are resolved like for internal clusters, but management, troubleshooting, and uh, hybriding are still to be figured out. And then one of the things that was surprising to me is there's more and more talk of uh, SaaS managed control planes, which actually dovetails to our demos um, pretty well, where the you use Google, or Amazon, or Microsoft, or, or Stack.io, or somebody to manage your uh, control plane, and then you bring the nodes. So you attach nodes to somebody else's managed control plane. Um, and that's, that's a, I, I don't know, I have to think about the model more. 
So what about um, uh, one of the things um, work in the booth, uh, rock in the uh, kilts and uh, rack in <laughs> booth. Um, I saw a lot of companies, uh, which was fascinating and clearly good validation for rack and digital rebar specifically, but it seems like there's a fair bit of shift that is happening in terms of bringing infrastructure back to on-prem and mm. Uh, a lot of people are starting to look at, you know, how do we manage uh, Kubernetes specifically, obviously in, in KubeCon, but uh, workloads in general, uh, right. which are starting to shift from cloud focus, public cloud focus to more hybrid and even pushing back into just private cloud. I, so I'm not sure that, that I would say back. Um, I, I, would, I would say that a lot of initial discovery is done in cloud today. Um, and then there's a lot of companies that have infrastructure that are thinking to you or thinking to are rethinking their cloud migration plans as they dive in. Um, and there are, there are some companies who are, uh, who, you know, who are all in on cloud and either are sort of stuck that way or are looking at, at reversing plans. But most of the companies I'm thinking of, that are looking at bare metal on premises or colo or already they have footprints there. So they're not, they're not spinning up a new footprint to recover, to, to take things out of the cloud. I'm not sure. Does that, does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. And I can't spell promises correct. So I'm just going to say prom. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so Greg and Victor, you guys were both there rocking the kilts as well. And uh, what did you, you were on the floor a lot, and I know both of you managed to get out to some of the uh, Kubernetes tracks. What did you, what's your takeaway from KubeCon? What are some of the things you saw? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I was in it for the socks. <laughs> <laughs> You were there for the socks, okay. <laughs> did you get your socks? Yes, I did. Uh, All right. No, I mean, uh, both Greg and I spent most of our time at the booths, and so uh, what I mostly got out of the, out of the food comp was uh, that uh, a surprising number of people were actually interested in uh, at least talking a little bit about uh, bare metal provisioning once we got Andrea roped in and uh, you know, got her to be trolling people to our booth, to our booth. So, that was fun. Okay. Greg, any thoughts? Just talking business with <laughs> companies and... No, I, I think it's what you guys have already kind of said around uh, people are beginning to realize that Kubernetes doesn't require other frameworks to run uh, on top of that it's physical infrastructure. So, um, there's some a lot of interesting orchestration and control tools that are beginning to emerge to manage and control the top level pieces, and it's beginning to look like. Um, You'll want like Kubernetes and Istio as a pair more than just straight Kubernetes, right? So there's beginning to seem to be a push for you want Kubernetes and you want some service mesh driver that's going to allow you to hook all your all your apps together, right? So right. it's not Kubernetes isn't just the solution anymore. It's Kubernetes and something else and on top of it and is what seems to be emerging out in a lot of the talks, mm -hmm. a lot of what people are talking about. So. Okay. Interesting. Well, I, I, I did see a lot of the discussions um, around that as well. And service mesh, as Rob touched on earlier, seems to be a very... Um, 
term du jour, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, Istio is definitely leading the charge with that uh, interesting technology there with the, the service mesh implementation that they have and the integration of the Envoy uh, proxy and load balancing service. It'll be interesting to see uh, where all of that goes. And it does seem like uh, Istio and service mesh stuff is a fairly large part of uh, future plans for Kubernetes for, as you're su suggesting, Greg, there's a lot of, of more on top of Kubernetes um, and operational requirements that Kubernetes needs to start driving that things like Istio and service meshes and uh, block storage and uh, container storage solutions are starting to uh, address uh, out of the operational side of the world. And that was one of the other elements I saw. Um, uh, Kubernetes tends to be f uh, um, fairly developer focused, but there was still a fair number of operationally focused tracks there. And I hope that that trend continues because at the end of the day, it's the operators that put the stuff in the field and use it and need to make it run and go forward. Um, Rob, you led some discussions in that regards uh, with the cluster SIG ops, I think it was. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cluster ops. I, and the, the cluster SIG ops stuff and people listening, please join us. Um, we meet bi-weekly on Thursdays at, uh, I think in this time slot. No, no, th two hours later in the 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central time slot. Um, uh, and the, the challenge that we get into is that the operators are very tied into their installers. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how to bridge communities so that we can have conversations that are more than, I got it installed using X and I don't know what to do next, right? Um, and that those really aren't happening as much as we'd like in the community, um, in part because a lot of the control planes are happening in black boxes. Um, and so you don't, you don't actually get feedback from Google about the things that they're doing to improve the GKE operational logging, things like that. But it's going to have to happen. You know, for Kubernetes to cross over into private, we have to have those operational concerns hammered out. Absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts on KubeCon, Cloud Native Con? Um, we kind of focus heavily on KubeCon, which was sort of the darling of the show. But uh, the other half of the show was Cloud Native Con, which uh, the CNCF fosters. Uh, Kubernetes as a project within CNCF as well as uh, Digital Rebar and several of the other solutions. Um, uh, any thoughts on CNCF and their involvement there? Um, I found um, actually, Rob, you were you had a discussion not too long ago somewhere about some of the differences in uh, OpenStack governance versus CNCF's governance pattern, and I saw that um, reflected in sort of the number of projects that CNCF are sort of fostering, but in an awfully sort of hands-off sort of way, kind of Dude. equivalent to, you know, helicopter parents versus <laughs> hands-off parents. Well, I, uh, CNCF doesn't, isn't trying to create an integrated suite. They're trying to foster projects that, that are, that have a certain architectural paradigm and are often used together. Um, OpenStack, tried to build this big integrated release out of a whole bunch of different services. And so um, it philosophically, they were very, very different. And then the added problem and, and Kubernetes intentionally avoided this when, when CNCF was formed, Kubernetes was the only project and they could have said it's the Kubernetes foundation. Um, but then that would have created this, this dilemma that OpenStack is facing right now if they're trying to branch into other, other areas related to infrastructure areas where it's confusing if you're dealing with OpenStack, if you're talking about the project, which would be the equivalent of Kubernetes or the adjacencies, um, which would be the equivalent to CNCF. And so they split the brand for, for I think really good reasons. Um, but it creates confusion when you're at the show and it's like, Oh, this is the CNCF show and KubeCon. And, you know, just like every, everybody else, just like us are mostly talking about, Kubernetes. <laughs> right. So, but it's, it's part of the incubation process. And I, I think that as other projects get bigger, they'll grow, you'll see a Prometheus or an Istio, you know, realist, you know, components in those shows that are much more significant. Right, right. And they're adjacent communities. So it's logical for people to keep talking about it. Um, 
while they're well, you know, you don't you wouldn't talk about Istio without having Kubernetes like in the conversation. Exactly. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Um, also on the agenda, we did a fair bit. A we, um, I don't know who's who's responsible for the the pile of code that is our new Terraform provider. It's almost a complete rework of everything. Uh, Greg, did you do all that, or Greg and Victor? That's all Greg. All me. All Greg. All right. So Greg, you're going to be responsible for this next fun section. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Terraform. Uh, Digital Rebar has worked on producing a Terraform plugin provider that allows the Terraform DSL to be extended to embrace bare metal provisioning using their DSL, which is very exciting because for the most part, uh, Terraform has been focused on cloud-based um, solutions and services from uh, uh, to be able to drive through the DSL and you haven't been able to treat bare metal on uh, equivalent footing or ground as you know, something like AWS or uh, Azure or GCE. Um, there are certainly other providers that allow you to operate in other uh, elements of private cloud stacks and hypervisor implementations, but for the most part, bare metal has been ignored. Um, not too long ago, what was it, about two months ago, I think we had our first release of the Terraform provider, which allowed just a very basic implementation to be able to drive um, uh, a set of hardware through to a Terraform ready state from Terraform ready state, allocate machines and bring up a profile on those machines. But we wanted to extend that. So I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Greg, and talk a little bit about some of the changes and implementations and things that we did and impetus for it. Yeah. So, one of the things we were looking at is could we get the Terraform provider hosted by HashiCorp and have it built in that process. And one of the things that they wanted to see were unit tests and better documentation. Well, it's HashiCorp, so not necessarily better documentation, but at least more, the stock. <laughs> more uh, consistently formatted uh, plugin and such as that. So I started looking at that and in the process, kind of took what we had, kind of maintained that to some degree, and then in the process added support for pretty much all the objects in the DRP. So the DSL that the DRP provider uh, enables can allow you to basically drive DRP completely. Um, there's a couple of caveats, but, um, <laughs> You can create profiles and stages and boot environments and all of those things through the DSL now, as well as inject uh, machines that you may already have while maintaining the uh, DRP machine object or resource using the Terraform term to manipulate um, and treat bare metal more like a cloud. So what we've done is given you the, the resources to drive the DRP objects and then an additional resource that lets you kind of use a pool to allocate machines. So like you can say, I want three machines driven through these stages, right? That's more like a cloud operation. And so that's kind of different than just creating machines. And the provider, which is kind of the original function, drives the same function that way. So that's still there and is the basis of what really we're providing. The rest of it was kind of, okay, we've had to implement some of the schema and other stuff for HashiCorp, then might as well add the other objects. Those were fairly straightforward. The system is now com not completely unit tested, but fairly well unit tested through the HashiCorp process. Um, it runs in Travis and gets validated the full time. There's a couple of changes to uh, DRP that were required for this. So um, that's going to happen or that's showing up. It will also require a repo change. So this change is pending. 
the DRP core work is in what will become 3.5. There will be a repo change associated with it, or um, a content change. The Terraform actual DRP content is moving out of the uh, provisioner repo because that will eventually hopefully be owned and maintained by HashiCorp, but the DRP content will move into the wrap and provided content bundle. So from the UI and the SAS perspective, you won't really see a difference. It'll still show up as terraform.yaml, but where it actually lives in our tree base changes. So the GitHub uh, repo that hosts the Terraform provider DRP will move to HashiCorp's repo is what you're saying? If we get it all approved, then it'll move yeah. out there and be available. Um, to use it, you'll still need the Terraform content. And, this, and the Terraform content stays in a DR or a rack and repo? In the rack and repo, correct. In the rack and repo, which is where it is right now. Correct. Well, no, it's not there right now. Oh. Right now, it gets injected into the SAS from the Terraform provider repo. Ah, okay. And that's going to change because I would prefer to not have the HashiCorp repo pushing into the rack and SAS. That would be hard for us to manage. That would be true. So okay. that's what's happening. Okay. Um, so looking at, uh, I had, here we go. So we touch base, move DRP content to the rack and provision content, start code reorg, make file, plugin, blah, 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 objects. Make nodes not runnable when destroying them. What about that? Oh, um, <laughs> so that's for the DRP machine case. Um, when you are going to drive a node through decommissioning, like you're destroying a deep rebar that you destroy a DRP machine. That's not a really destroying the machine object. That's merely saying, I'm done with it, put it back in the pool. When we do that, we don't want the machine to be runnable. We're going to reboot it. And we don't want any tasks or stages that should be run post reboot to happen too quickly. So we mark the machine not runnable. It's basically what we've been telling the community channel to do when they want to change stages and a stage may end up in the same boot environment. You don't want tasks to run too quickly. So you, we mark the machine as not runnable and then reboot the node so that when it comes back up, it will become runnable. I found that when playing with our crib stuff. Ah, uh, yes. Good so, crib. We like crib. And so <laughs> with the Terraform provider, you can now do the crib demo with a Terraform file that has two entries in it. You want to expand on that? I think one, to, one to create the. Ah, that was the uh, other item. Kubernetes Thank you. Profile. But anyway. Uh, one to create the crib profile and then one to um, bring up machines and put that profile onto those machines. And then it brings up encrypt finishes. And when the Terraform provider returns, Kubernetes installed. The interesting thing with the process is that you can do that with both the RAM only and the CentOS style. But if you're in RAM only and you tell the system to decommission, it'll immediately run the system through Discover and reboot it. And that causes you to lose your boot environment, your re dis rediscover stage. It's run too quickly. So that's why you have to mark it not runnable. It's the same thing if you were driving it manually. Okay, which kind of gives us a nice segue to the um, bullet point that I forgot about earlier for the agenda, which is crib extensions and new features. We had some thoughts around adding some uh, more interesting uh, stuff around that. And I'm in the dark on all of that. So uh, talk to me, Rob, Greg, Victor, who's, who's brainchild of those? I'm guessing Rob's DNA behind that. <laughs> uh, I can, I can give you the feedback that, that I, that I have and, and requests that I've gotten since I've been doing the demos. Um, and maybe that's a good place to start. I'm sure Greg has uh, some technical 
technical thoughts. Um, so one of the things that I think about from that uh, along these lines is when I give the demos for crib, it, it, because it's one stage with one task and one template, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't show composability as much as I, as I, as other things we've done. And that might just be the stage where it's in. So at the question behind that is, are, does it make sense to break up uh, the crib template or ta into multiple tasks? Um, I don't know, it might not be warranted because uh, it's already pretty simple. Um, and then the other, so we can discuss that and I can hold the other points or I can go di dive into all my points and then we'll come back to them. Fire away. You got the mic. Uh, so the, the other, so the other thing that uh, somebody asked me about was Istio and having crib install an Istio mesh. Um, Cause Istio requires host modifications. And so installing Istio is a little bit trickier. And so it might be a, um, an interesting feature to add. And then the third, the third item is um, being able, instead of, uh, using uh, kube admin and knit to create the join script to be able to inject a join script from a hybrid Kubernetes. Shift tab will take you backwards, by the way. Yeah, I know. Thank <laughs> you. The third uh, sorry, inject your, join your notes. Your notes are awesome. I'm, I'm sorry to kivitz. <laughs> Don't derail inject, me. I'm in the inject, zone. Inject a join script from um, a hybrid Kubernetes. I like GKE. Hi. You've totally thrown my <laughs> mojo off. Now, now that you know we're watching. That last one already worked. Oh, cool. Be fun to demo. Then. Well, it should have, I mean, it's already there. You right. just need to have, you just set the master to a UUID that will match no one. And then you set the join script to be the join script you need to join that cluster. And then you just boot nodes. And as long as there's a path from those nodes to the IP of the admin node, it should work. I think that's, I'm going to make that a little holiday treat for myself to work out the GKE side of that. But you would need the, the join command. You just dump that in as the parameter. So basically, instead of starting with an empty set, you populate uh, the pieces, the, and then just run the node. I wonder if StackPoint uh, also allows that. Look, Rob, I just shift tabbed. Nice. Yay. He's trainable. Can teach Learn, le lesson um, of the day. <laughs> um, I didn't know it. My additional item is to add um, additional crib parameters to allow for customization of the cluster at mm. startup time. Specifically things like um, some of the networking ranges and uh, eventually one that could envision some of the um, RBAC configuration. Uh, what about storage? Adding an external storage, open EBS, or any of the other storage capabilities? Yeah, the, that's additional path. That's longer term. I don't think there's a obvious winner for some of that yet. And that's actually an interesting observation from both Kupan and our work here, is I would love for Crib to be able to do an HA um, control plane, but that's not an immediate target for the Kube Atom toolset. People talk about wanting it, but nobody's really stepping up to do it in a reasonable way. Is what seems to be coming out of the um, community or the community or the. Yeah, I mean, the challenge is that they don't want to inject a tool like digital rebar into the mix that would make this a non-issue. Yeah, there's a whole host of reasons, and that's definitely. Uh, so I thought Kube ADM was going to be the one. 
Correct. It is. <laughs> and, and Everybody and thinks theirs is going to be the one. About HA is what I'm if you're yeah. it, it is, and they have to solve it, but they're not moving forward with it. So it's kind of one of those. It's, it's actually not staffed that much. I and thought then, it the official thing, Rob. It is, it, so it is the official thing. This is OpenStack has this exact same dilemma. You've got a, a tool that is neutral and everybody has competing components. And so the, the vendors who are investing developer resources are, you know. Their own thing that's value added. Right, and so it's, it, so Kube Admin is right now going around recruiting and, and adding features that support other people's installers on sort of the idea of um, if you, you know, we'll add the features to Kube ADM if you can migrate your thing over to what we do. Well, we are the asking, board, you will be assimilated. Well, so, I was asking about it, right? And so the people are asking like, oh, you want to write it? And I'm like, well, I could, but you won't like what I come up with. Right. right, because my solution will potentially use something like DRP to make sure all the stuff works right. And they're like, oh, well, I don't want that. I'm like, work right. Exactly. You won't. And so that's why I don't really want to spend time writing it. Because from my perspective, the solution for hard, bare metal hardware is different than in GCE, which is different than in Amazon. And that's the fundamental rub that an HA Kubatom has to solve is that it needs to be able to address the, I'm running in a certain location, and that has certain implications for what HA means. And the way they've done HA in the past, you know, requires some extra baggage, like they're having to right. Like, and the, this, this to me is where our analysis of Kubicon come, comes in a little bit. So anyway. It, it's right. just confusing, you know, when you talk about these installers, like I've heard Kube ADM is the blessed one of, of over, but it, it, I just don't see how people can take it seriously until it does HA, you know? And I, the underlay thing, you know, whether you're cloud or on-prem, you got to deal with it. <laughs> it's a part of the problem space, right? Well, and that's why you see so many, so much fracture in the community because everybody has their own way or idea of what infrastructure is to them. It's AWS, it's GCE, it's their bare metal implementation for us. It's, you know, it's everything to everyone and you know nothing to someone else it's it's yeah. an awfully hard problem and it needs to be abstracted from the os layer i think and completely separated from the os install layer for an ha installer to operate correctly at the infrastructure or at, excuse me at the application layer but at the same time the reality of that is really hard to implement but it has been solved in things like puppet chef salt stack you know, going back in time, configuration management tooling in general is designed to solve that problem space. And I see uh, the Kubernetes people ignoring the uh, lessons learned from those solution spaces. Kubespray tried to do that with Ansible, but not everybody wants Ansible. So you've got that religious war of not my DevOps tooling. <laughs> well, it, it, also, it also doesn't handle the number one case that most people in cloud are dealing with, which is immutability, right? It, the Ansible story is not a particularly good story if you're gonna add and destroy nodes. I mean, it sort of does it, but it, it's not, it's, it's, it's lacking also because of the way Ansible works. Yep, so. agree. Yeah. All right, so we've, we've hammered on Kubernetes, we've hammered on Crib, we talked about KubeCon and Cloud Native Con. Uh, before we kick over to uh, feature planning of Victor, give us three or four minutes. Um, you have some changes you're considering in around the provisioner repo. This came up recently in uh, town community on Slack. Um, first, just give us the one minute uh, elevator pitch, what the provisioner repo stuff does and, and what's the change we're looking at. Well, so the... Uh... It's not really provision or repos, it's actually package repository that got my name screwed up. Whatever. Sorry. Um, but um, what that is, is that is uh, how you can tell a digital rebar in sort of an OS agnostic way where it should install packages from. 
And that code's been in there for a little while. I added some special case to template expansion to make it uh, easy-ish to use in both uh, you know, kickstarts and pre-seeds and uh, whatever you're using templates to expand out your uh, young configuration files or your uh, app repositories or whatever. Um, but I'm adding another feature to uh, DRP that uh, should enable us to be able to uh, run DRP without ever having to upload an ISO or a sledgehammer image or any of that stuff to DRP to have it explode in serve files locally. Um, and to do that, I'm leveraging a feature of packed repositories where a repository can, uh, ha can have a flag called install source on it, which says that, uh, which basically is a flag to the system to tell it that uh, you should use this repository whenever you're generating lines that would be used to install an operating system, like in the like in the Kickstart to tell it where its base URL is, or in the Preseed to tell it where uh, it should get its basic set of packages from. And I'm extending that functionality to also have it uh, use that repository as a source to get uh, kernels and initrds from um, via some transparent proxy stuff that I probably shouldn't that I probably shouldn't go into too much detail here. Um, and that works fine with the restriction that the only way you can do that is by adding your provision of repos into the global profile because at the point in time in which we are serving up kernels and NDRDs, we have no idea what machine we're actually serving them to. It can in fact be a machine that hasn't been discovered and doesn't even have a record in the in DRP yet. Um, and so my thought for alleviating that was to take the provision of re or to take the uh, package repository stuff and create a new, uh, you know, first order object just called uh, repos, and um, allow you to uh, specify them there and add a mechanism to be able to add uh, repositories that are specific to a given machine or a given set of machines, probably along the same vein that we currently use for uh, profiles. Um, and so I was looking for community feedback on uh, who's using the who's using package repositories right now, and what they're using them for, and try to get an idea of uh, how much pain I would inflict by making that move, or see if you know the restriction that you know if you're going to put all your package repositories in the global profile and not care past that point for any for any OS you want to install, if you know that works just as well. Okay, so. Let's, uh, well, is there any feedback or questions on that? Uh, I didn't want to go too deep into that, but wanted to bring it up and sort of chuck it out there for the community to mull over and see if we had any feedback on it. Um, so, uh, so with that, there was a, we came up with a reason to do it as a first class citizen today. Um, or at least I now have a use case for it, which is if you wish to be able to define it as immutable content, you can't today. You can't in the global profile. The global profile is defined as rewrite per DRP instant content. Yeah, and it, it can't be made available for a huge variety of other reasons. <laughs> yeah. So if we wanted to be able to say repos are a part of a content layer, then they have to be a first class citizen in the way we operate today. Because hmm. if we did it otherwise, then we'd you know, have an immutable default pro or an immutable global profile, which would uh, you know, violate a lot of people's access. So would it, would it be possible to just create a test that automatically assigns a profile and then once the machine's in a profile, it would solve this problem? Or? That's the whole problem with the situation, Rob, yeah. is that for, this is really for the discovery case. Okay. If I want to serve Sledgehammer and have Sledgehammer served off of my provisioning box, then I need a way to reference that, those files, right? As Victor was describing, right? Yeah. I don't need an NRD. You need to be able to have a generator reference before any machine object exists, before any profile other than the global profile is available. The only thing we might have is a lease at that point, and even then we can't guarantee that. That is correct. And okay. so, 
at that point in time when, at which we're serving kernels and init RDs, um, we could, at best we could get a vague, a, a, you know, a, a, a vague guess as to who we might be talking to. So we can't really do it as a per machine thing that way. Right. And it's basically for the, the main issue arises because of the discovery case. The rest of the, when we serve actual boot ins to machines for install purposes, those we have machines and we could do a per machine kind of profile thing. It'd be kind of neat. But that feels a new to you inside the, it messes with the course code base in a way that it's if, if it's, if I can sort of summarize it, I think it's starting to move towards something that we haven't really touched yet um, in terms of DRP's capabilities, which is applying classification to uh, enable automatic workflow to forgive the analogy flow based on whatever classification elements we just we discover as part of the provisioning process well this would happen the, the challenge that we're trying to address with this is that it happens even before we get to that classification Okay, but this is la starting to lay the foundation and groundwork down that road. Well, the uh, kind of the use case I had in mind, and I, I know this is kind of near and dear to uh, Rob's heart, is uh, say we wanted to move to a model where we could throw a DRP on a switch. The switches mm -hmm. are, uh, switches ah, are ah. You know, having uh, SCADs and SCADs of storage available to upload, you know, multi gigabyte ISOs to oh my God. file trees. Um, so, we provide a look aside that says, oh, by the way, um, for all of your OS install things, go talk to this. And since we can't really do uh, redirects on TFTP, we can just transparently proxy uh, the files. We can just transparently proxy any TFTP requests over to a remote HTTP server. Interesting. And okay, so that, yeah, now that's definitely the first half of our discussion, which was, um, related to the package repo changes, but I think we sort of diverged a little there with the use case that Greg was talking about. Well, the, the interesting thing is it's the same data. Yeah. I mean, right now when we explode an ISO, it contains the pa package repositories, and inside those package repositories are the kernel and init RDs that you need to boot off of to do the OS install. So from our perspective, we've treated them as the same data sets. Because in general, you'll construct them as a single data set. Right. right. And so we've been trying to maintain that. And so as we look to maintain that, we had built a profile parameter that contained that, right? That's the package repository stuff that Victor had put in. There's a couple of releases ago now, a month ago. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap up the discussion yeah. on this thread because we have. Uh, uh, just about 10 minutes left and we have a couple other things we want to cover as well. Uh, if anyone has any feedback or thoughts on the package repository stuff, uh, crib extensions, uh, Terraform provider discussion, everything we've talked about today as always, please drop into the Slack pound community channel. If you don't have an uh, invite from us yet, hit us up on rackend.com slash support slash Slack. We'll send an invite. Uh, we're going to move on to DRP35. So we have not yet cut uh, the 35 tree, but we are pretty darn close. And I think, uh, Greg, if I recall, you said something around maybe today, maybe tomorrow we'll be cutting that tree. And I don't know where I put my notes on it, so I'm stalling. In the meantime, let's go to um, uh, release notes. So, Greg, uh, you want to talk a little bit about some of the release notes information that we've got going on, what's happening in uh, 350 yeah. release. Yeah, so um, let's see. The features that are showing up, parameters can now have default values. Victor added that. Um, it allows you, when you specify the schema for a parameter, say what the default value is. It will be available to the nodes as a, when they do their template expansion but it will not show up as an aggregated value just because we didn't want to clutter that everywhere. Um, let's see, a couple of DRP CLI updates. One is uh, Victor added a status command that you can run that will indicate 
the uh, state of DRP? Are all the services running? Are they up? Stuff like that. We also updated the parameter calls to allow you to take standard in. This is a feature and a bug fix. Um, the reason people were having problems with um, the go high discovery boot environment and we're having to switch to the no go high is because the go high was returning too much uh, data for the command line and blowing out bash. Mm. So this allows you to redirect the go high input through standard in and that takes care of the go high death problems we were seeing. There is a content change update for that bug fix but this feature allows you kind of to do it for parameters in general. Um, and then a feature for us, maybe not for y'all, is that the DRP server can now be built directly just by doing go build. And it will exclude the embedded assets. This allows you to do easier integration testing. So we particularly use this for the Terraform providers integration tests so that we don't actually have to spin up packet servers and all sorts of other stuff to validate that uh, Terraform's driving the API correctly. And then a host of bugs. Which is also a requirement from HashiCorp is the testing aspect of things and this allows us to meet that much more cleanly. Yep. So um, some bug fixes, we can't, we can't delete the global profile now, the AT. Um, we cleaned up some API models, hence the 3.5 change. They should be transparent, but the machine model had a profile object in it that contained the parameters. Now that seemed like a good idea when I did it a long time ago, but it's just silly. So we removed that and deprecated it. It's still there. If you update it, it'll move things into params. That'll go away, but right now, Everything should be accessed to the params field, much like a profile and plugin. So all the objects are not going to match that way. And then metadata is now updatable through the API. It wasn't before because of internal representational issues. So the Go structures changed, but the API uh, import export did. Um, so we, we might be, may be able to expose that in the UX in the future too. The parameter. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, apparently my phone is attacked to my map. Um, let's see, parameters, there were some bugs around empty schemas inside of parameters. We handled it in one case, but there are a couple other cases that, as we were playing with, found. Um, uploading the ISOs through browsers would not generate proper names. Turned out that was actually a bug inside of DRP, so we fixed that. So you're not stuck with the name of the ISO on your file system of your browser. Um, the, address, the address cache, we were noticing that people needed to specify static IP more often than we thought they should. So Victor reviewed that and found that we weren't necessarily updating our discovery cache when we talked through the API. And with a lot of our use cases, we're now driving only through the API. And so it was causing the machines to get invalid IP to talk back to the client. So that took care of that. And then um, in playing with Terraform, the API has a way to list all the objects in the system. And uh, that list was missing some. Oops. So we fixed that. Um, so that's kind of what's there. There will be another API change, which should be mostly transparent, but will bump the major version again, or minor version again, um, to, uh, as we go forward here, um, but I didn't get it in yet. And so that'll probably be a 3.6 uh, down the road. Yeah, so the, the Go structures have um, some nuances that are different, like DHCP options in subnets is a um, parameter or is a embedded structure where in subnets it's a pointer to a structure and while when it gets rendered and passed around on the wire through JSON doesn't matter. Um, it just looks kind of strange when you're doing things programmatically in the API when you get a 
list in one case and a list of pointers in another case. And so there's a few places like that where we want to um, re-normalize that where everybody's playing by the same rules. And we'll most likely get rid of the, point, the pointer based version so that it actually represents the fact that you're passing structures around versus passing them in the around. So and just realize that's that's coming. It should make no changes to the actual API sides uh, unless you're actually jumping off and using our Go API directly. And if you are, tell us all about it. Yeah, please. <laughs> all right. Um, looks like some interesting changes, some nice uh, cleanups and some bugs and some addressing some uh, existing issues that we've enhanced our capabilities around, particularly around the address cache, which is nice to, to see. Um, that release will probably be out in the next few days. Look forward to the full, final release announcement in the Pound community. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to bring up before we wrap up, we have a couple minutes left. Um, not too long ago when all of us were in the office in Austin, we did a podcast on uh, patch API, Swagger, and integrations. And uh, that podcast came out really nicely. It might be a nice uh, bit of information for individuals to review if you're curious about some of the more in-depth workings of how we use JSON, uh, JSON patch, how we manage that with the API, and some of the interesting fallouts uh, that came out of that in terms of being able to provide um, some more immutable and sort of locking capabilities across clusters and helped us with uh, cluster bring up mechanisms by which we need to have a master come up first and then uh, followers of the master uh, then uh, come back to the master and, and integrate which is part of what we do with the crib stuff but it's a general pattern that can be used for other um, cluster related software so it's not just the Kubernetes uh, uh, rebar immutable bootstrapping process that we've enabled it's a general pattern for any cluster based software that can be extended into a stage and workflow capabilities. So interesting stuff there. Check it out. Uh, I've dropped the, the link and information into the uh, agenda uh, topic as well as we'll probably drop it. I think we dropped it already maybe in the Pound community channel. If we haven't, uh, we'll do that. Uh, any feedback or questions from the community? We've got just a, about two minutes here to wrap up. Anything from our uh, friends and community, which is you today, Will. Hi, I'll speak for the community. Um, <laughs> and uh, a near and dear thing to my heart, I was hoping to get into 3.5 is what, weren't you guys going to do uh, a change where you could put uh, a, uh, uh, a Kickstarter pre seed template in the profile? Yes, that was on my plate. Um, I got it started, didn't get it finished. Uh, that won't necessarily precipitate. Um, a release version requirement. It's a content change. Oh, and cool. that's mostly done. It's just a matter of figuring out the matching for uh, genericizing the pattern uh, for um, the OS type. So uh, that was, we had discussions about that and we didn't follow up on that. So yes, Will, that's still on our plate and that's still looking forward to coming out. Just not quite done yet. Wasn't there an issue, something that we had to get working as part of that that got got covered in, in three five? I thought maybe not. Maybe it's just content. Yeah, mostly just content. Okay, that's good. All right, yeah. cool. Okay, excellent. Uh, that's a wrap for version seven. Uh, appreciate everybody's involvement. Uh, a lot of really good things we covered today. Uh, as always, like I mentioned earlier, rebar.digital, rackend.com, meetup.com slash digital rebar. All of them things is also listed in the agenda. Uh, lots of good podcasts. Uh, we had lots of good webinars uh, recently on Crib. So all of the stuff we've been talking about is out there on YouTube or you can find it on our website. And again, as always, Slack Pound community, touch base with us, let us know what you're thinking. Love you all. Uh, we'll talk to you guys next year. Merry Christmas, <laughs> Happy New Year, and Happy Hanukkah, or whatever it is that you uh, celebrate over this next few weeks. Enjoy, and we look forward to talking to you in 
2018. Nelly Kalipi Mata. <laughs>